variable. Identification is done through a poverty line, and this has been unchanged for hundreds of years. By the way, there is discussion as to why it should be a poverty line or if there should be a poverty line at all. Angus Deaton was one who proposed that, said maybe we shouldn't have a poverty line. It seems like an artificial way of deciding who's poor. Maybe we should have fuzzy things. Maybe we shouldn't have anything. Aggregation, I'll talk to you about FGT. There's also a new paper out. It's kind of spread over into the other line here. But Foster Gear Thorbeck 2010 is a retrospective, a 25-year retrospective, on where the measure has come, what it's done. And many of you have references in that paper. I mean, I refer to your work in that paper. And it's written by FGT. So we call it FGT2, I guess. OK. Unidimensional poverty. Example, we have a distribution. It's hard to see in the back. Sorry about it, guys. Uh, 7348 is your, let's call it an income distribution. Poverty line, Z equals 5. OK, so what is poverty? Hmm, let's see. Deprivation vector is given by G0. What is deprivation vector? It's simply telling us whether you're poor or not, according to the criteria. 0 if you're not poor, 1 if you're poor. The two middle people are poor. The headcount ratio is the mean of this vector. So you have two people poor, four, not four overall. Two out of four is a half. So the headcount ratio is a mean, a mean of this interesting vector, which I will generalize to a matrix in just a second. Normalized gap vector, the one that's trying to give you an idea how below the poverty line people tend to be. Well, there we invoke normalized gaps. And we take the poverty line minus the income over the poverty line. In the case of person two, it's the poverty line, five, minus three over five, or two-fifths. For the people who are not poor, it's still zero. There's your normalized gap vector, and of course, take a mean of that, and that's simply your poverty gap measure. Right? So this is why statistics work so nicely with the measures. So that everything's a mean anyway. Finally, squared gap. Square that same vector. Each entry is squared. So you get four twenty-fifths rather than two-fifths. Now notice the comparison between two and three. It was one to two before, now it's one to four. The person who is more poor has their poverty ex you know, focused upon more. It's given greater weight. The weight is the gap itself. So take this vector, take the mean of the vector, and you have the FGT measure too the squared gap measure. So here is a nice brief introduction to unidimensional measurement. We know the great properties of this class. It's decomposable across population groups, which many of you have used. It has neat policy implications. As you go to higher levels of the measure, you have more interesting and more intuitive transfer properties defined. That's for Guignon and Fields, neat little paper. And there have been tons of other papers that explore these properties for the measure. OK. Well, there are, in going from single dimension to multi-dimension, I want to talk about some of the challenges before I actually do it. And to frame those challenges, let's look back at the reasons why we're moving forward into multi-dimension. You know, why should we extend? And how, if we want to, should we extend? And the important point is we want to keep the key features of a unidimensional approach that has been so successful over the years. Why should we accept dropping features that we had before if we're improving? So why extend? I actually talked about that previously. How to extend, that's what I'll focus on. And those are where, that's where the challenges come in. So capability approach, that's all well and good. It's also hard to implement in practice. You have cardinal and ordinal variables, in d sorry, qualitative and ordinal variables in describing a capability. It doesn't necessarily allow you to compare how far up and down the ladder you are. Capabilities are very often written in qualitative terms. You have to implement the approach to cover these sorts of crude data. This is hard. This is a challenge. Data themselves. You can't simply take 
willy-nilly from one income, from one uh, data set and from another set and combine it together and think you're measuring poverty. You're not. For a person-focused approach that preserves the properties of the unidimensional approach, you want to focus on whether a person is poor or not and be able to describe what their conditions are or a region or larger groups, aggregate up. So for a person approach, uh, focused approach, you can't simply combine data sources. Multiple unidimensional approach is not the same as a multidimensional approach. Okay, so you can apply the FET in health and get something. You can do like what we did and apply the FET to calories in our original paper to get something and many dimensions to get something, but it's where the, they intersect, which is so interesting and so policy relevant, I believe. So you need a single source uh, household survey in order to do that, and that's a challenge. That's a challenge. Tools. Unidimensional measures, the first ones that I saw, happily thought that every dimension had the properties of income. And even as soon as you go to education, years of schooling, which I'll critique but then use, don't we all? Years of schooling is not education. It's a great cardinal measure, years of schooling, for years of schooling. It may not be such a great cardinal measure of education. Okay? So there were inapplicable generalizations because they didn't account for ordinal data in the original types of poverty measures. And they seem to not spend as much time on identification, whereas in multidimensional poverty analysis, who is poor is extremely hard to think of. And so you have to start from the ground up to achieve that part of poverty measurement, the identification step. So you want to go beyond saying that, well, if you're deprived in any dimension, you're poor. That seems a little extreme. Likewise, you're only poor if you're deprived in all dimensions. That's extreme. So we wanted something in between, and that's the challenge. What in between? Okay. Demand, the final challenge and chance. It's, yes, we are having a lot of interest from everybody, but we at OFI and at GW next door can't do it all. The UNDP can't do it all. People down the road who want to do beyond MPI, okay? We all can't do it. We have to have more people who can critique, can help with individual countries, can guide us in a variety of ways. And so it's a shared effort. Otherwise, it isn't going to go anywhere and we'll be down the road another 10 years before someone's able to implement uh, something that is being demanded right now. So I hope that you'll be able to, at the end of my discussion, frankly give me your opinions and discussions because that's what I like. That's what I thrive on, okay? So I'm inviting your discussion when I'm done presenting the discussion, the, uh, the new methodology. Okay, so the Alkire Foster methodology is now being presented. What it begins with is that, a matrix of data. Now what are those data points? Well, you have people, you have dimensions or domains, the first one looks kind of like some income notion. The second one could be years of schooling. The third one could be some self-reported health from one being the worst to five being the highest. The last could be access to certain type of social services. You get the point. Okay. Within these dom domains, deprivation cutoffs. I'm giving you this as an example. 13, 12, so you have to achieve high school, right, in order to be considered non-deprived in the second dimension. For self-reported health, one or two, poor and fair, is going to call, make you deprived in that uh, dimension. You get the point, okay? And for one, with a cutoff of one, it means that zero is the only deprived state. Well, yeah, you don't have the social service being provided to you. All right, so these entries with lines underneath them fall below the deprivation cutoffs. Okay, so person two is deprived in domain two. Okay? Person one is not deprived in domain one. Okay. So let's replace these entries. It's hard to see those lines underneath. Put a one there and a zero for other people who don't have deprivation. And this is the so-called 
deprivation matrix, analogous to our vector we just had a second ago. I call it G0 for obvious reasons, because I called the previous one G0. All right, we can see that person two is deprived in dimension two and none others. Okay. Now, let's go back to the original matrix and think about an analogous construct to the normalized gap vector. For a particular domain, look at the cutoff, subtract the achievement, put it over the cutoff. That's all allowable within domain if you have cardinal variables. Again, I'm going back and forth. In order to go to these next two steps, I'll have to have some notion of cardinality or else it won't work. Okay? So these other two measures require more. So the normalized gap is defined as such. Replace the entries with those gaps. To remind you, look at person two, domain two. It's 12 minus 7 over 12, and that is 0.42. Do the same for all of them, and you'll see this matrix will arise. Notice the ones for the social service. If you have a dichotomous variable to begin with, you're just going to get zero ones anyway. Okay. All right, and you know the next step. Square those, and we obtain <laughs> these numbers. Go to the next step, right, which would be take the alpha power. But I won't go there right now. I'll take you there later. So we have three matrices that I'm interested in here. The first matrix is the deprivation matrix. Second is normalized gap. Third is the squared normalized gap. Let's turn to the question of identification. Who is poor? Look at the indicator of who is deprived. Now, I would probably argue that the first person here is not poor, not deprived in anything. I might also argue that the last, the middle person, the third person, is poor, <laughs> deprived in every single dimension. It's those other folks that we have some trouble with, okay? And it's that which causes the problems for multidimensional identification. Well, one of the ways of thinking about identification in this framework, and I'm using four dimensions, four domains that implicitly have equal weight. Atkinson, in his discussion of how to do multidimensional stuff, says, identify, make sure that you have dimensions that are approximately equally important if you can. If not, then we'll have to go some, you know, do something else. But I'm going to start with that approach. So equal weight means that we could count the dimensions in which you're deprived and use that as a kind of index of your situation. Person two has two deprivations. Three has four. Person four has only one. Who is poor? The first approach that I mentioned before is a union-based approach. You're poor if you have any deprivation. So the ones with underlines are poor, the last three persons. The difficulties with this, of course, are that the single deprivation could be due to something other than poverty. I mean, there can be mistakes made for a variety of reasons. And this seems a little extreme, particularly if you have a large number of dimensions to require a person to be poor if they are deprived in one. If that's the case, then we can't adopt this approach. By the way, the union approach, just for practical folks, predicts extraordinarily high numbers, which is why even if you have cardinal measures and you apply cardinal indicators and you apply the measures that exist, you get extraordinary numbers many times. So that's not necessarily politically viable <laughs> in a variety of circumstances. Well, let's try an intersection approach. That is, you're only poor if you're poor in everything. Of course, person three becomes the only poor person in this environment, and the difficulties there is it's likewise a demanding requirement, particularly if the number of domains or dimensions is large. And it often identifies a very narrow slice of the population as being <coughs> poor, and in fact it, it approaching zero in many, many reasonable cases. So what do we do? What we're doing is something in between. Now, that is arbitrary, right? And I'm going to justify this by saying, guess what? The poverty line we've all been using and loving in income space is pretty arbitrary in itself. And I would argue this again and again, no matter how justified by whatever criterion you use to construct that poverty line, once it's in place and used for the next 10 years, what you're doing is something which is fixed and given, or what we call arbitrary. I have no trouble with this. I think it's important to take a bold step and be arbitrary. 
The dollar a day made a lot of sense to, in certain purposes. 